Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's good to see you and uh, Merry Christmas. I haven't had a chance to, to say that to most of you yet. We'll all be saying uh, Happy New Year by the time we uh, are leaving the building. Uh, so it's good to say Merry Christmas. I want to thank you again for everybody who has uh, written cards and, and sent them to us, uh, to the manse. We really appreciate all of that. Um, it was good to celebrate Christmas in the manse. We were delighted. Uh, that the Christmas decorations could go up without having to be put into the attic and taken down again. Uh, so we were, we were, it was great to, to have Christmas Day in the manse, folks, um, and it was good to be, be here in, in Gerald's Pass. You'll know, folks, all of the restrictions that we're facing, all of the, the things that are going on at the minute, uh, means that we won't be having any activity in person other than Sunday worship over the next month. So for the month of January at least and probably into February will not be having any in person uh, anything in person other than Sunday services uh, we will however go online uh, we got used to that back in uh, March and April and May time June time uh, we're going to get used to it again I think so we'll, we'll go online for our midweeks uh, at least but we're still we'll still take a, a break uh, for the next week or so and I'll be in touch with you uh, about where we're going to be starting up midweeks again. This is our last service today in John's Gospel. We'll be starting a new series next week uh, in Mark and we're going to be spending some time in Mark's Gospel. Uh, I think we'll probably be in Mark right up until June so we'll, we'll uh, stick with Mark uh, right through uh, most of this uh, term and year at least. Our theme today, if we're going to have a theme for our service, is that Jesus is better. Jesus is better. And that really is the theme of the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews wants to tell us that Jesus is better. And it starts by telling us that Jesus is better than angels. Our call to worship today comes from Hebrews chapter 1 and verses 1 to 4. And it tells us that Jesus is better than angels. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Jesus is God's final word to us. Jesus is what God wants to say to us. We don't look to angels because Jesus is better than angels. And we're going to be thinking today about how Jesus is better. And so we come to worship Jesus. He is the one true and living God. So let us worship God. And we'll do so first of all. By standing together, if you're able, stand with me as we pray. Our gracious God, we praise and thank you for your Son, Jesus, today. And we come into your presence, gathered with your people, to worship the Lord Jesus in public. We want to praise and thank you for who Jesus is and for what he has done. We thank you that he is the word of God, that he is the light of the world and God in the flesh. We praise you that Jesus is full of grace and truth. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came into this world, that you entered into the the, the muck and the mar on the difficulties and sufferings of this world, that you took human flesh upon yourself 
and enter into the sufferings of humanity. We thank you that you know what it is like to be one of us. Because you are a human being. You are fully man and fully God. We thank you that you didn't just come to this world to, to rule and reign in power and might, but you came to serve. You came to love us by serving us even to the point of death. You died for your people. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are called Jesus because you came to save your people from their sins. We confess our sins before you today. Each one of us have sinned in the things that we have done and the things that we have said, even the things that we have thought. We are sorry that we have broken your commandments. When we read the law found in the Bible, will we find that it only condemns us. It shows us our sin. And so we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have come to bring grace for grace. That you have come to give us what we don't deserve, to give us everlasting life in your name. We pray that through this service of worship, which is centred upon you and your word, that you would feed us and sustain us today. We pray for any here who don't know you, who have not received you as Saviour and Lord. We pray, O oh God, that they would come to know Jesus. That by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would open their eyes to see that Jesus is their Lord and that you are their God. We pray too for us who are trusting in Christ, that you would feed us today by your word and that you would build us up. We praise and thank you for all of the blessings and benefits which come to us by being united to Jesus. When we receive Jesus we receive all of his blessings. And we thank you, God, that you do not keep any from us. So we pray that you, O oh God, will be glorified even as we are blessed in this service of worship to your name and for your glory. Amen. We can take our seats, folks. We have confessed our sin to God in prayer. And if we do confess our sin, if you have confessed your sin today by agreeing with the words that I've been saying, well, God wants to assure you that you are pardoned your sin. Our assurance of pardon for the month of December comes from John chapter 1 and verses 12 and 13. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. We can be born again. We can be born into God's family. Jesus came so that we could be treated as a son of God. That is good news for us today. There are so many benefits and blessings for us when we receive Jesus. He is full of grace and truth. And when we receive him, we receive his fullness. And we'll be thinking about that in our sermon a little bit later. But now we're going to sing together about the benefits that come to us through Jesus. This is Psalm 103. The tune is Before the Throne of God Above. Uh, we sang this back in November. So hopefully you will remember it, it'll be familiar enough to us. We'll keep our seats as we sing Psalm 103. Praise God my soul with all my heart and be exalt his holy name forget not all his benefits his praise my soul in song proclaim. The Lord forgives you all your sins, and heals your sickness and distress. Your life he rescues from the grave, 
I crown you in his tenderness. I crown you in his tenderness. He satisfies your deep desires. Of his unending stores of good, so that just like me, he will strength, your youthful vigor is renewed. The Lord is known for righteous acts, and justice to downtrodden ones. To Moses he made known his ways, his mighty deeds to Israel's sons, his mighty deeds to Israel's sons. The Lord is merciful and kind, to anger slow and full of grace. He will not constantly remove, or in his anger hide his face. He does not punish our misdeeds, forgive our sins and just reward. How great is love as high as heaven towards all those who fear the Lord, towards all those who fear the Folks, this, what we've just sung, this is grace. But God does not punish our misdeeds or give our sins their just, just reward. If God was to give us what our sins deserve, well, that would be death. The wages of sin is death. And yet God, in his grace, does not give our sins their just reward. Because of what Jesus has done, God instead gives us life. This is God's grace. It's great to sing about God's grace. And that's one of the things that we're thinking about today, of Jesus being better because Jesus is full of grace. Well, let's turn now and read about that from John chapter 1. If you have your Bible, please open it up at John chapter 1. As I said, this is our last Sunday in John 1. We'll be starting Mark next week. We're getting to know John chapter 1 pretty well, at least the first 18 verses of it. As we read, we remember this is God's word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Amen. 
We thank God that he blesses us when we read his truth. We're back in the Catechism again today for our affirmation of faith. And we're entering into the commandments, the Ten Commandments. And so the question, question 45, asks us, what is or which is the first commandment? The answer is the first commandment is thou shalt have no other gods before me. Well, to help us understand that, the Catechism enters into this pattern, and we'll see this with the rest of the the questions on the commandments. It asks us what is required by the commandment and what is forbidden by the commandment. So question 46 asks, what is required in the first commandment? The answer is the first commandment requires us to know and acknowledge God to be the only true God and our God and to worship and glorify him accordingly. That's what we are all commanded to do. That's what God's word requires of us, that we worship God, that we acknowledge God as the only true God, and that we worship and glorify him accordingly, as the one who gives us life and re-gives us life through Christ. Question 47 then asks, what is forbidden in the first commandment? The answer is the first commandment forbids the denying or not worshipping and glorifying the true God as God and our God. And the giving of that worship and glory to any other which is due to him alone. We see this, don't we, in our world? We see it even in our own lives, in our own hearts, that we deny or that we don't worship God or don't glorify him as the true God. That maybe we think the good things in our lives come from our own works or our own efforts. And we don't give glory to God for them. Question 48, special for the first commandment, asks us, What are specially taught by these words before me in the first commandment? The answer is these words before me in the first commandment teach us that God, who sees all things, takes notice of and is much displeased with the sin of having any other God. God does not want us to worship other things. And when the commandments were given to God's people at Sinai, there were people who worshipped idols. They carved little idols out of stone or out of wood and they bowed down to them and they worshipped them. We might think, well, those are primitive people. We would never do such things. But yet, even in the last week, haven't we worshipped idols? Haven't there been things about Christmas that we wanted to happen that couldn't happen because of coronavirus? And they weren't all things to do with Jesus. A lot of them were to do with us. We make idols out of presents. We make idols out of food or family. We make idols out of toys. We make idols out of money. John Calvin said that the human heart is an idol factory. So easily we are distracted by all sorts of things in this world that are not God. And we give glory to them. We worship them. We think that our our hope relies on them. I'll be happy if I get. We even turn ourselves into little gods. We worship ourselves. The first commandment puts this burden on us. says you're required to worship God. And him alone. says you are forbidden from worshipping anything else. I'm going to think about the law a little bit in our sermon in just a moment. But before we come to our sermon, let's bow our heads and pray together and ask for God's help. Our God and Heavenly Father, we need your help today. And we thank you that you do help those who call upon you. And so we ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would open our minds today to understand what you're teaching us through the scriptures. 
that you would open our hearts to believe it, that we would trust in it, and that we would receive today the fullness of Jesus Christ, his grace for grace. For it's in his name and for his sake that we pray. Amen. Now, boys and girls, you'll have noticed that uh, there's no kids' talk today as such based on the catechism. Uh, and that's because I want us to um, I want us to, to think today all together. So boys and girls and grown-ups, you're all involved in the sermon today. And there's one thing, isn't there, boys and girls, that every grown-up wants to know in December. Every grown-up wants to know this in December. Before Christmas Day, we all want to know, is he coming? Is he going to come to your house? And then after Christmas Day, every grown-up is asking, well, did he come? Did he bring you presents? Did he come to your house? We all are very interested in Santa. We're all very interested in Santa. We want to know about Santa Claus. And I hope he did come. I'm sure he brought all sorts of presents to the boys and to girls. I know he came to our house. He was keeping a list of who's naughty and who's nice. And if your house is anything like ours, there were plenty of warnings before Christmas Day. Remember to be good so Santa will come. Joel was very impressed with Santa because Santa brought you exactly what you asked for. Isn't that right, Joel? It's just amazing how Santa did that. Christmas Day is over. Here we are at church again. And we are here to worship Jesus. And the big message that I want you to take away today, well, it might be a bit controversial, but I don't think it should be. The big message is that Jesus is better. Jesus is better than Santa. Because Jesus is full of grace and truth. It's right there, isn't it, in John 1? We, we read it, if you look to verse 14. <laughs> In verse 14, we, we learn that Jesus is the word of God come in the flesh. We read that John, who, who wrote this book, John has seen his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. And what does that glory look like? What does John tell us that Jesus is like? He says he is full of grace and truth. The only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. And so Jesus is better than Santa because Jesus is full of grace and truth. And those are the two points I want to make today. Jesus is full of grace and Jesus is full of truth. We're going to start with truth. Over the last month, some of you will have seen Santa or at least you'll have seen some of his helpers perhaps. But even if you've met one of Santa's helpers, you can't really say that you know Santa. We don't know Santa. He, he didn't come to our house for Christmas dinner. We might know what he looks like because of his helpers, but that's not the same as knowing the man himself. And what John is saying here about Jesus is that Jesus is the real thing. Jesus is full of truth. Jesus is the one who shows us exactly what God is like. Because Jesus is God. And so if you want to know God, then you need to look at Jesus. If you want to know God, you need to know Jesus. Now, John doesn't mention Santa in this passage. But he does compare Jesus with the law which is given through Moses. The law is, is another way. It specifically describes the commandments, but the law of Moses is another way of describing the Old Testament, the books that Moses wrote. You see, in those books, in the law, there are lots of pointers to Jesus. But those pointers are not the real thing. They're like signposts. They show us towards the real thing, but they're not the real thing. Think about the sacrifices in the Old Testament. The sacrifices commanded by the law, they were signposts. 
They taught the people of God that there could be forgiveness for sin. And they taught the people of God that what was needed that for sin to be removed and for people to be made right with God was that something needed to die. There needed to be blood. But those sacrifices, well, those sacrifices had to be offered day after day and week after week and year after year. The people were never done making sacrifices because the sacrifices weren't the real thing. The sacrifices couldn't forgive sin. The sacrifices were signposts. They were pointing the people to Jesus. Jesus is full of truth. Only Jesus is the real thing. Only Jesus can remove our sin forever through his once for all death on the cross. The sacrifices weren't real. They weren't the real deal. They were signposts. Normally I talk about this at a wedding. And I say, wouldn't it be foolish to look at the ring on my finger and imagine you knew everything about my marriage? Even if I took the ring off, it doesn't stop me being married, does it? The ring is a useful signpost, but that's what it is. It's a signpost pointing to a greater reality. So it is with the law. With the Old Testament, when we read the Bible, we see these signposts, these shadows of Jesus. The law was given through Moses and it's full of pointers. It points us to God's salvation through his son, but none of them are the real deal. Only Jesus is full of truth. Jesus shows us God. That's how our passage finishes. You see verse 18? No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. The good of God to show us himself, to reveal himself to us through Jesus. And so if you want to know the real God, the one true and living God, if you want to turn away from worshipping idols, to worship the real God, well, you need to come to Jesus. Jesus reveals God to us through his word. How kind and gracious of our God to do that. And that brings us to our second point. Jesus is full of grace. And in this way, Jesus is way better than Santa. We've all heard about Santa's lists. There's a naughty list and a nice list. And the question for all boys and girls at this time of year is which list are you on? Have you been good? Are you going to get presents? Or have you been bad? And you're going to get a lump of coal? And if you're on the wrong list, how do you get moved to on the right list? Is it possible to get your name rubbed off the naughty list and moved on to the nice list? Doesn't it seem? And I think I think you can, Joe, but what do you have to do? You have to be really, really good. You have to try really good, really hard to stop doing all the bad things and start doing all the good things. And if you're good, then Santa will give you presents. Santa treats each kid the way they deserve. If you can be good, he'll give you good things. And if you can be bad, if you are bad, then he'll give you coal. But that's not the way Jesus does things. Jesus operates by grace. Jesus is full of grace. And what that means is that even though we are on the naughty list, we still receive God's gift. In fact, what we really need to do in order to receive God's gift, is realise that we are bad. And that we can never make ourselves good. The only thing that we contribute to our salvation is not our works, it's the sin that makes our salvation necessary. You see, grace is God's undeserved favour. Santa gives kids what they deserve, but God in his grace gives us exactly what we do not deserve. And that is the gift of his own son, Jesus, who is full of grace. Now again, our passage doesn't mention Santa. Instead, again, John compares the grace of Jesus with the law. 
can see in verse 17, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus. You see, the law is a good thing. It's a really important thing. It does something helpful for us. It tells us how to be good. In fact, the law tells us how to be perfect. That's what the Ten Commandments are. The Ten Commandments are God's word on how to live a perfect life. But if you were to try and keep the law even for a moment, you would fail. Think about the commandment we've read today. Does it seem possible to worship God and worship him alone 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Not allowing your mind to drift from God for even a second? Some people find it hard to concentrate on God even for a whole sermon let alone for the whole service, let alone for the whole Sabbath day. So what about the other six days? It's really hard, isn't it? It's really hard not to let our minds be distracted by something. To, to hear something or to see something that takes our focus away from God, even at Christmas. Christmas where, where we're meant to be celebrating the coming of Jesus in the flesh, and yet, so many ways we make it about ourselves and what we want. We put our desires above the one true and living God. So what the law ends up doing is it ends up setting a standard that we can't keep. It demands this perfect life and it's impossible for us to live up to it. The, the bar is so high that we can't get over it. The law actually ends up doing something else for us. And that's also really important. The law shows us how sinful we are. The law shows us that our names belong on the naughty list. It's like a mirror. When we look in the law and we see perfection, we realise how imperfect we are. And the thing about the law is it can't save us. If you could keep the law, then it would save you. But you can't keep it. And so the law ends up condemning us. And the punishment for not keeping it is death. We're on the naughty list. We can't keep the law, so how do we get on the nice list? Think about looking at yourself in a mirror. And you see this big, dirty mark right down the front of your shirt or the front of your top. How would you clean that up? Would you try and rub it with the mirror? You wouldn't do that. The, the mirror is not made for that purpose. The mirror is made to show you the stain, but it's not made to clean it or remove it. And the law is like that. The law is good. It is important. But what it does is show us our sinfulness. It cannot remove our sinfulness. The law wasn't designed to do that. We need to remove the stain of sin in our lives is Jesus. We need God's grace. The law has no grace. It sets the standard and expects you to keep it. Jesus is full of grace. The great news of the gospel is that Jesus kept the law. At every point, Jesus was perfect. Because Jesus has kept the law, you can become clean from sin. In Jesus, you can be made perfect in righteousness. You see what John says at the verse of six, at the start of verse sixteen. Of His fullness, we have received, and grace for grace. The law demands us to get 100% and we cannot do it. It shows us that we're sinful, that we're on the naughty list. But Jesus, Jesus in his perfection has got 100%. And if we receive him, his mark becomes our mark. If we receive him, he gives us his result. So even though we are failing, God places us on the nice list. That's grace. 
That's what grace is. It's God's grace and it comes through Jesus who is full of grace. The fact of the gospel is that there is no sin. None. No matter how great. That cannot be forgiven. All sin can be forgiven because our standing before God does not depend on us. It depends on Jesus. But you have to receive him. You can't be proud and say, I don't need Jesus. I'll get through on my own. I can do this. You can't say, I try my best to be nice to everyone. The law only condemns you. It shows you your sin. But through Jesus, there is grace. If you receive Jesus, God treats you not as you deserve, but as Jesus deserves. You can become a child of God through Jesus. Friends, I don't want you to worry today about giving your life to Jesus. I want you to know that he has given his life for you. Will you receive him? His perfect record can be yours. Jesus is full of grace. He keeps on forgiving those who sin. So no matter how deep your sin goes, Jesus' grace is deeper still. So Jesus is better than some. Because Santa wants you to try hard to be on the naughty list or to be on the nice list. With Santa, there's no grace. But Jesus is full of grace. He does for us what the law can never do. He gives us himself. And his perfect record becomes ours when we receive him. And you see there in verse 16, it's the fullness of Christ we receive. Not only grace, but grace for grace. That means just when we think God's grace has run out, when we think we've got to the end of it, there's always more. Grace is always available for sinners like me and like you. God's grace will never run dry. Think about it like this. On Christmas Day, in the evening, I could hardly move. I couldn't face another mince pie. but I'll probably go home and have some leftovers today. I still need to eat today. And that's what the Christian life is like. We need to keep eating. We need to keep getting grace for grace. Coming to church, being fed by God's word, being sustained weekly by God. Many people think that God might bring us in and, and then let us go. God doesn't bring us in through his grace and then let us get on with it by ourselves. It's not like he, he sets us on a bicycle, gives us a shove and expects us to pedal our way to heaven. God feeds us and renews us by his grace, week after week after week. Despite the fact we let him down day after day, God forgives us day after day through his grace. We receive Jesus. We receive his fullness. Full of grace. That happens especially as we read his word. As we pray. As we worship him in our own homes. Privately and with those that we live with. Day by day. And especially here on a Sunday in worship. This is where we feed on Christ. We feed on his word as it's read from, as it's prayed through, as it's proclaimed. I know this has been a difficult year. It's been a difficult year for all of us. And some people have had a more difficult year than others. And some people have had a difficult year for the obvious reasons. And some people have had a difficult year for things that they are keeping to themselves. Big things and little things. And it's good to end the year with the joy of Christmas. 
But it's even better to know that while Santa has been and gone for another year, Jesus is always with us. He's giving his life to us. That's the message to finish the year with, that Jesus will be with us next week. And the week after that, and the week after that, on through 2021, we can receive from him the fullness of his grace and truth. And grace for grace for grace. We can know that God will lead us and guide us. That he will forgive us our sins and that he will sustain us today and next week and even forever. Folks, Jesus, it's way better than Santa. Let's stand and pray together. Our God and Heavenly Father, we praise you today for your only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you that through Jesus we can receive grace for grace. We thank you that you do not treat us as our sins deserve. You do not punish our misdeeds because you have punished them on Jesus. We thank you that, Lord Jesus, that your name is Jesus because you came to save your people from their sins. That you came into this world to live a, a perfect life, to keep the law perfectly so that we can receive your record, so that your mark can be ours and, and we can have 100%. So that no matter how many times we let you down, there is always grace. Help us to, to believe that, to, to stake our lives on it. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are way better than Santa. Because you are with us, even now. You will be with us and continue to be with us into the new year and even forever. We praise you that we can come to worship. We thank you that the government has allowed us to continue worshipping you publicly, that we can be sustained and filled and fed throughout this Christian life. We pray, Lord Jesus we would continue to be committed to you, that we would continue to receive you, and that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would give us a passion and a zeal for you and your word, that we would grow in our knowledge and love of you. Because you are the truth. You are the real deal, the one who shows us and who is the one true and living God. We pray today for all those who have found this time of year difficult. We pray especially for those who are grieving at this time of year and, and who have an, an empty seat, who've had an empty seat at the table, have lost loved ones, even those who have lost loved ones in, in recent days. And we do pray again this week for the Moffat family. We continue to pray for Sam and Hazel and, and for Lauren and Natasha and Nathan. We pray, oh God, that you would give them the strength to get through the funeral service tomorrow and you would continue to sustain them, that they would know the fullness of Christ at this time, that they would know the truth of Emmanuel, God with us. We pray, Heavenly Father, for all those around this world who have been kept from celebrating Christmas because they live in a country where they are persecuted for their faith. We pray today for those who live in communist regimes. We pray especially for the leaders in those regimes that they would be converted to Christ. We pray too for all those Islamic parts of this world that you, oh God, would show a great turning in their hearts. That they would turn away from idols to worship the one true and living God. We pray that in your grace, you would bring your word and you would bring conversion to those people. We pray too for those in our own part of the world who have struggled this Christmas for financial reasons. 
We pray, Heavenly Father, that people would continue to look to you, would continue to look to Jesus and would hope in him. We pray as we look forward to 2021, not knowing what the future holds, not knowing what lies around the corner, we pray that we wouldn't anticipate anything other than you are with us in this new year. Our prayer is that you would go with us. And if you do not go with us, God, we do not want to go. Pray, Heavenly Father, for your presence among us through Jesus Christ, who brings us his fullness and grace for grace. Each week and each day as we look forward to the future. It's in his name we pray and for his sake alone. Amen. Friends, we're going to bring our service to a close by singing together of, of those tidings of comfort and joy that come only through knowing Jesus, that the angels brought to the shepherds, uh, keeping their sheep outside Bethlehem. God rest ye merry gentlemen. We'll keep our seats as we sing. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Saviour was born on Christmas Day. To save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. From God our Heavenly Father, a blessed angel came, and all to certain shepherds brought tidings of the same. The heaven Bethlehem was born, the Son of God by name. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Fear not, then, said the angel, let nothing you affright. This day is for a Saviour of a pure virgin bride. To free all those who trust in him from Satan's power and might. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. The shepherds at those tidings rejoiced in heart and mind. And left their flocks a feeding in tempest, storm, and wind. And went to Bethlehem straight away, the Son of God to find. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. And when they came to Bethlehem, where our dear Saviour lay, they found him in a manger, where long sent feet on day. His mother Mary, kneeling down unto the Lord, did pray, O oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy, Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Now to the Lord sing praises, all you within this place, and with true love and brotherhood each other now embrace. This holy tide of Christmas, Father, doth deface. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy.
Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. This day, next week, next year and even forevermore. Amen.